Hello, Honors Pre-Calc students. Mr. Hazelhorst coming to you live from A08 with your Chapter 9, Section 7 video. Uh, we're going to use this video to review concepts of probability uh, that you covered in Honors Algebra 2. So again, we hope this video uh, is just a good refresher and it'll help you be ready to go Monday uh, as we come back together. All right. Well, with that said, let's jump right into things. So we want to begin with the basics of probability. Uh, so as you know, finding the probability of any event is, is pretty simple. Uh, just some notation to be aware of. You're going to see uh, notation like this pop up quite often now. So we have P of E, and E is just representing some events. So we're just saying, in general, the probability of some event is equal to the number of successes that we consider in that event divided by the total number of outcomes in that event. And this is where our counting rules can come in helpful is in determining these number of outcomes, all right? Now, when we calculate a probability using this simple little formula, that means that it is okay for probability to be expressed as a fraction, a decimal, or a percent. Uh, the key, though, to any probability is that it needs to be some value between zero and one inclusive. It's okay to be zero. That means that that event is impossible mathematically from a probability standpoint. If it has a probability of one, that means it's a certain event uh, guaranteed to happen. Uh, just like the fact that next week you're going to have some homework at some point. That's got a probability of one. Guaranteed. All right. So let's continue on with our probability uh, thoughts here. Uh, let's use this information here real quick uh, to introduce the idea of a sample space or review the idea of a sample space. So it says describe the sample space for tossing a coin three times. When you see that term sample space, that just means we want to come up with all possible outcomes of whatever experiment it is that we're looking at. Now, what's helpful in a situation like this sometimes is to use something known as a tree diagram uh, to help us create the sample space. So if I draw a tree diagram, uh, I'm going to begin with just a point, and I'm just going to think through my sequence of events here. So I'm going to flip a coin, right? So as I flip that coin, I've got two outcomes, which means I have two branches off my tree diagram. So I can either be heads or tails. Uh, then I'm going to flip that coin a second time, and I can either get heads or tails, but this time the heads or tails branches off the event that preceded it. Okay? So you can see our tree diagram growing with each sequential event. So now we flip that coin a third time. And we've got all possible outcomes. Now, in a tree diagram, each branch is representing an outcome. So as I work my way down this branch, heads, heads, heads would be an outcome in the sample space. Okay. Now, in your textbook, you're going to see your... Uh, your book use set notation to list out uh, the outcomes in a sample space. So if we did that with this problem, our sample space would be, and we use a brace, now we just list out every possible outcome. And I'm just going to read across my tree diagram from left to right. So we'd have heads, heads, heads. We'd have heads, heads, tails. We'd have heads, tails, heads, we have heads, tails, tails, we'd have tail, head, head, tail, head, tail, 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 head, and tail, tail, tail. Right? So, though so that would be our sample space of this setting. We've got eight different outcomes. Uh, if we ask what was the probability that you flipped uh, two heads in this problem. Well, we could just go through and identify what are all of our outcomes that have two heads. So we'd have heads, heads, tails, heads, tails, heads, and tails, heads, heads. So we'd have three out of eight branches that result in three heads. All right. So that's describing a sample space. Pretty simple. All right. So let's continue on here with probability. Our next item up for grabs is the idea of probability lingo. So there's three kind of phrases that we'll see quite often pop up in different probability problems. We'll hear the phrase mutually exclusive, uh, the phrase independent events, and the idea of a complement. So we want to uh, cover each of those items here with you real quick. So first off, the idea of being mutually exclusive. What that means is that the events are disjoint. Um, 
So we could break that down. The events do not share any possible outcomes. So if we think of, of two items, sometimes it's helpful to see this in a Venn diagram. So if we had two events, A and B, all right, what this Venn diagram helps illustrate is notice that they share nothing in common. All right, to be mutually exclusive means I am A or I am B, but there is no overlap, okay? Uh, that means that they're mutually exclusive. So these events cannot exist at the same time. We can be one or the other, but not both. Uh, again, they don't share any possible outcomes. Uh, you can think about a deck of cards, right? The idea of drawing an, um, a heart or a club, those are mutually exclusive, right? There is no card in the deck that is a heart and a club. I can be a heart, I can be a club, but I can't be both. Again, they're mutually exclusive, okay? Next up, independent events. The idea of independent events means that uh, the occurrence of one event has no impact on the other. Uh, the key fact in independent events is that the probability doesn't change. Okay? If we think about things that occur with replacement, those tend to be independent events. Okay? If I was drawing a card from a deck, and let's just say I wanted to find the probability that I selected a red card. Right? Well, if I draw that card in, at the beginning, uh, I know that the probability of, of pulling a red card from a deck is one half. Okay? Now, once I draw that card, if I leave it out, right, and ask, okay, what's the probability that I draw a red card now? Well, that probability is changed based on the event that preceded it. Okay? But if I put the card back in the deck, then those remain independent. The probability doesn't change. Okay? So again, a lot of times replacement uh, is something that we see in those independent event settings. All right? And then our last term that we want to cover on this slide is the idea of a complement. Now, notice that it's spelled with an E, not an I, so we're not telling you that your hair looks nice, although your hair does look phenomenal today, by the way. Uh, but we're talking about a complement, all right? Uh, so if I have an event, uh, A prime is its complement, all right? That's the little notation that we see up here. Uh, it's the probability uh, of the complement is just simply... Uh, really the opposite. It's one minus the probability of an event occurring. So if you were watching the news today and they said, hey, the probability that it snows tomorrow is 70%. Well, first off, you'd all be really excited because you'd be getting your hopes up for a snow day. But the complement of that event is the probability that it does not snow. Okay. So if there's a 70% chance of snow, there's a 30% chance that it does not snow. And notice that those two events combined add up to one, all right? That's the idea of a complement. All right, continuing on here. So let's get into some notation of probability settings. So we've got two kind of important um, ideas here that we want to cover. We want to cover the idea of a union and we want to cover the idea of an intersection, all right? Now, each of these have special symbols that you're going to see pop up in your textbook uh, and at different times and problems. A union is the symbol of, it looks like a U, all right? And what it means, if I had A union B, essentially we're saying A or B, okay? Now, it's important that we understand what or means in probability settings. And so I have a Venn diagram again to help illustrate this. So if I had two circles representing A and B, and they overlap each other, all right? So these two events are not mutually exclusive. They're not existing separately. All right, there is a portion of them that overlaps. All right, so in order for us to be A or B, well, that really means we can be one of three things. We can be just A, we can be A and B, or we can be just B, right? That's the union. We're, we're representing the entire area of these two combined, okay? Now, the intersection, all right, it has a symbol also. It's an upside-down U. So if we see A intersect B, right? the word that we want to associate here is the word and. Right? This means A and B. So again, to illustrate this in a Venn diagram, right, we take that same Venn diagram, but now that we say and instead of or, and means it's only the overlap area. It's the intersect. It's where these two circles, these two events, intersect each other. That's the and. Okay? So those are important symbols that we need to be able to uh, to distinguish between. And they're helpful because they pop up in some of our probability rules. All right, so let's go through three rules of probability. 
and we want to make some more word association connections here. So uh, the first rule of probability says if A and B are events in the same sample space, the probability of A or B occurring is given by, and, and notice our formula here, notice that we use those symbols that we just illustrated on the last slide. So again, read this here. This is saying the probability of A or B is equal to the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A and B, okay? Now, let's talk through why we have this little subtraction here. If we go back to our previous Venn diagram, right? If I'm finding the probability of A or B, so I'm using this Venn diagram here on the left side, right? Well, when I find the probability of A, that's the entire A circle. And then when I add to it the probability of B, it's the entire B circle. But that intersection area gets included twice then if I add their separate probabilities together because it's included in the A probability and it's included in the B probability, all right? So that's why we have to subtract the intersection area on the end of that formula. And we'll illustrate this example in just a moment, okay? The second rule is if A and B are mutually exclusive, okay? Again, remember that means they're disjoint. They don't have anything in common. There's no intersection area, okay? So what this probability re formula reads then is the probability of A or B is equal to the probability of A plus the probability of B. Notice that we didn't have to subtract the intersection because if they're mutually exclusive, there is no intersection. Okay. Now, essentially, uh, the first rule here covers all or situations. Uh, and the second rule only works in those specific situations where our events are mutually exclusive. Okay. All right, our final rule to cover today is the multiplication rule of independent events. Okay. So the probability that A and B will both occur, all right, so if we're trying to find the probability of A and B, now I could have put the upside down U symbol in here as well, right, and that would also mean and, but the probability of A and B is just the probability of A times the probability of B. Now the connection that we want to make from these rules of probability uh, that will be helpful to you as you work through problems, right? If I see the word or in my question, Right, if I'm asked to find the probability of A or B, whoops, excuse me, let's go back here. Uh, if I'm asked to find the probability of A or B, right, notice the operation is essentially addition. Right? When we see the word or, we want to think add. What our bottom rule tells us is if we see the word and, we want to multiply probabilities. Okay? So let's practice those rules here to finish out the 9.7 video, all right? So here's some example problems. Let's start out with this one, all right? Let's say draw a deck from a standard deck of playing cards. So real quick, here's some information about a standard deck of playing cards. There are 52 cards in a standard deck, okay? Uh, we do not include jokers in the standard deck of playing cards. Uh, those 52 cards are broken into two different colors. Um, half the deck is red, half the deck is black. Uh, those 52 cards are also broken into four different suits. Uh, you can have aces, or excuse me, uh, diamonds or hearts, which represent the red cards, clubs and spades, which represent the black cards. Uh, within each suit, there are 13 different cards. Uh, you have an ace, a king, a queen, and a jack. The king, queen, and jack are sometimes referred as face cards because they have faces on them. And then you have the numbers 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, and 2. Uh, there's not a one card. Sometimes the ace will represent a one card, uh, but it's not considered a numbered card, all right? So there's just a little information about a deck of cards. All right, so here's our problem. What is the probability that a card is a heart or a club? Now, hopefully a word that jumped out of you as we read that problem is the word or, right? So when we see the word or, what operation do we want to think? That's right. We want to think addition. All right, so the probability that the card is a heart or a club. So I need to take the probability that that card is a heart. Uh, well, again, remember the deck is made up of four different suits divided evenly within. So the probability of being a heart is one-fourth. The probability of being a club is one-fourth. So now we need to ask ourselves, are these events mutually exclusive? Okay. Is it possible for a card in the deck to be both a heart and a club? Well, the answer to that question is no. So we don't have to worry about subtracting in the intersection area here because there is not one. So our probability comes out to be two-fourths. 
which would reduce down to one half. All right. So there's our first probability problem. Again, or means to add. All right. Next problem here. Okay. What is the probability that the card is a heart or a face card? All right. So again, same thing here. Probability of being a heart. Well, we know that's one fourth. Probability of being a face card. All right. There are 12 face cards in the deck, three in each suit. Okay. So we would have 12 out of 52 face cards, uh, which we could reduce down to three out of 13. Okay. Now, we, again, we have to ask ourselves the question, are these events mutually exclusive? In this case, the answer to that question is no, because it is possible to be a heart and a face card, so they do overlap. We have three cards in our deck that are hearts and face cards. The, heart, the king of hearts, the queen of hearts, and the jack of hearts. So we need to subtract those. Let's fix that here. Let's make that a subtraction sign. All right. So our probability then, if we get some common denominators, uh, well, the one-fourth would be 13 out of 52 plus 12 out of 52 minus 3 out of 52. So we end up with 22 out of 52 as our probability. We can reduce that down. All right. Last problem here in our video. All right. So let's say we're going to draw a card from a standard deck and roll a die, a standard six-sided die. All right, so our probability question this time is, what is the probability the card and die are sixes? All right, so here we see the word and. What operation should jump out at us? That's right, multiplication. All right, so we're just going to take the probability that the card is a six, all right, um, which would be one out of 13. There's one six per suit. And the probability that the die is a six would be one six. So again, we just multiply those together. One times one is one. 13 times six is 78. And there's our probability. Okay. Uh, there's a one in 78 chance that we complete these two tasks that they both result in a six. All right. Well, that brings us to the end of our chapter nine. Uh, that should say seven video. I apologize. Or this is the end of the chapter nine, section seven video. But I want to encourage you to make sure you did watch the 9.6 video. And again, make it a great day.